City Skylines is a game that can be fun or frustrating depending on where your city is in its growth process. So before you hit the reset switch or turn on the cheats or look to mods for help, I want to talk about how to troubleshoot your city, how to fix problems in your city, and how to do it all legitimately. Now today you're seeing footage from the console version of Cities because I want to stress that all of these fixes, all these things that we'll talk about today can be done in the vanilla game without mods. So it doesn't really matter what platform you're on, Xbox, PlayStation, Switch, or PC, all these tips and tricks should apply. And just to keep things a little bit easier logistically, I'm gonna go through the info views, talk about all those things in order, just so that it's hopefully easy to follow. But I'm also gonna put timestamps in this one because it's gonna be a longer video today, but we're gonna go through all the different things that can go wrong with your city and hopefully some tips and tricks on how to fix those. So if you hold Y or Triangle on Xbox or PlayStation, it's one of those buttons. They mix them up on the Switch. Or if you look for the I in the corner of your screen on PC, you can bring up info views. And this is gonna tell you a ton of information about our city. Now the very first thing that we're greeted with is electricity and electricity availability. And this one's pretty straightforward, but I wanna talk about a couple things that can throw you off if you're not sure what you're looking for. So, First of all, where are we at in that slider? Well, we're well into the green, which is a good thing. We're consuming 483 megawatts right now. We're producing 704. You can see it's jumping around and it will jump around depending on time of day, especially. If it's night, people use more electricity to light their homes. If it's cold out, they may use electricity to heat their homes. Now that may not matter too much if you're not playing on a snowfall map, but if you are playing on a snowfall map, that can make a huge difference. So keep in mind, temperature can affect your electricity usage. Now, regardless of what power plant you're using, it needs to be connected to the grid. When we go into power lines, we can see that all buildings have this blue bubble. And as long as those bubbles are overlapping, they'll connect power to the next building on down the chain. But in this case, our power plant's kind of off by itself. So we need to connect power lines from say this bubble over to this bubble to extend here. But then as long as we see blue bubbles, right, we're passing that electricity on and it can just kind of go on forever, spreading around the town all the way around this loop. Something to watch out for is this icon right here though. This is basically telling us that this power line is disconnected. It's not taking the power anywhere. So if we look at that, we can see that, yes, it's lit up blue, but it's not connecting to a bubble. This may be useful when we zone here later, but for right now, we don't need that. And if we want to get rid of it, we can bulldoze that line without any consequence because it just really wasn't doing anything at the moment. Off on the edge of my map, I've got a couple windmills powering my water treatment plants over here. They're otherwise totally independent and not connected to the grid at all. And we can see here that I also don't need power lines because the blue bubbles surrounding the actual wind turbines are large enough that they extend power down to the sewage treatment plant. If we jump back into our info views, you'll notice that, you know, we're right around a comfortable green spot. We're not too far up, but we're also not into the yellow or red. That's when people will start complaining. If we go into economy and look at our budget, you'll notice that I have my electricity up to 100%. I can hit wire triangle or just look at that separate slider on PC to see what the day or night budget is. And again, we'll use more electricity at night, so you may have to set that budget independently. Now, if we wanted to back that down a little bit because we're producing more power than we need, we could. But an important thing to note is that you'd be turning down the electric budget and ultimately the amount of electricity you're producing everywhere. So if we cut our budget, say, in half to 50% because we've got something like the Fusion Monument powering our city, but we had a little area like this right here that was powered on its own by a couple wind turbines that would cut that electricity budget by half and may affect power delivery over there because maybe you don't have you know twice as much capacity as you need over here but you're doing the rest of the city thanks to a monument so some different things to keep in mind just remember that when it comes to electricity consumption you need to have enough availability in the city but it also has to be interconnected and if you do turn the budget down, make sure that those isolated pockets like this one you see on screen 
still have enough energy, you might have to add more if you're going to otherwise turn the budget down across your city. I'm going to set the budget down to 75% for electricity just to show you one other thing to keep an eye out for when it comes to problems. Let me play it at three times speed also so that this will happen a little bit faster. And you can see that, you know, now that we're not producing enough electricity, the power problems start to happen towards the edge of our grid. Those things that are further away from the power plant. So most of our power is coming from over here at the nuclear power plant. And the further away you get when you're under budget or not producing enough electricity, you'll notice those problems happening on the far side of your grid. If we turn that up to say 80%, that should fix some of the problems. But again, those people that are further away from the power plant are the ones that are going to still have problems. And just to show you one more time, let's jump up to 85 and really the people only on the very, very edge of the grid, if anyone, should be having problems at that point. So you can see we're slowly pushing those problems back further and further, but uh, we'll jump the economy back up to 100%. I just wanted to show that for uh, a quick example that you'll find those power problems that are supply related on the far end of your grid first. To the right of electricity, we'll find water, and that is our availability for water intake and sewage output. Now, as far as getting water into the system, there's a couple options. You have a water pumping station, and you also have things like the water towers, and there's a couple variants on those depending on what DLCs you have. Now, over here, we've got our sewage output which I'm dumping off into a completely separate river. Now this is late in the game, so I've got the eco versions of the water treatment plant, which almost totally reduce the pollution. When you combine that with a monument like the Eden Project in the end game, it means that you're basically pouring clean water back into the system. Be very careful of water flow though. So for example, this would not be a very good spot to put a water intake. You know, we're, we're cleaning the water right now, but you don't want the sewage upstream from where you're intaking water. Those arrows show which way the water's flowing, and it's pretty obvious which way the water's flowing when we look at um, a high speed section of river like this. But, you know, things will slow down in certain spots. And certainly if we look at the lake, there's no water flow here. So we can't dump water or sewage into this place if this is where we're also getting water from. You have two kind of choices in that case. Well, I guess three. You could uh, get your water from water towers and pour your sewage, say, into the lake on this particular map. Or there's also options to drain that sewage into the ground with some of the inland water treatment plants. Those are part of the Sunset Harbor DLC. So looking below those basic sliders, right, we've got the availability of water and sewage, which is also affected by budget. So keep that in mind. You can save a little bit of money if you're well into the green. If you are in the yellow and you don't want to build new infrastructure, you could also raise the budget a little bit to get more capacity. But generally, it's best to be as close as where you need to be rather than build a bunch of stuff you don't need and under budget or not have enough stuff and try and over budget to get that capacity. And when you're connecting up your water pipes, you'll notice that there are two, one in blue that handles the water and the other in green, which handles the sewage. You only have to run one pipe. You don't have to run separate. They're all done at the same time. If you want to overlap pipes for best coverage, you can come out at a 90 degree angle from an existing pipe, 440 units or a cost of 440. And then that'll build two perfect parallel lines that just kind of overlap each other just the tiniest little bit. You can go 460. I just like that little bit of overlap rather than that tiny little bit of space, say, that you get with 460. But both work whatever way you want to go. It's a nice way to create a gridded system that you can just piggyback off of and expand as you continue to grow your city. You'll notice that although I have really free flowing roads, the pipes that you don't see underneath are pretty much a grid. And again, just extended as we build the city out. You'll need that underneath your zoning. You'll also need that pipe to connect to your water intakes and way over here to our sewage output. Now, uh, just to show you, I did a little trick here. And if you want to hide some of your water pumps, you can use the landscaping tool to build a canal at, say, the bottom of this lake. 
and then we can snap water structures to the side of that. So we can build that there. We can also do something like a water treatment plant and build that on the other side. That generally is not a good idea though. You don't want to pour out sewage where you're pulling in. Um, it is possible once you have the Eden project, but just generally a bad idea. Separate out your water, always the safest bet. But that little trick with the canals is a really cool way to hide some of that infrastructure. It's also why I have this single <laughs> power turbine out here um, in the water because it's supplying power to those water structures that are hidden underneath. At the very least, I would have to run something like a power line like that if I wanted to uh, power that water. If you like the look of that better, that can work too. Ignore the fire in the background. It's no, I'm sure it's no big deal. Speaking of fires, next on our list is fire safety. And generally, the next few things that we're going to talk about have a lot of similar concepts. So where water and electricity, we're mostly worried about where those meters are. You know, are they in the green? As long as everything's connected, you'll be fine. Down here, when we think about fire, police, health, education, there's a couple different concepts. And one that's really important is these green roads. Uh, now, I've seen so much confusion and uh, <laughs> I, I'd like to set a couple things straight here. So the green roads basically are how effectively that service can cover that area. So, for example, right now we're looking at fire safety. So all the buildings that you see in purple are some sort of fire structure, whether those are smaller fire stations, larger fire stations. Maybe it's the fire helicopter depot. Maybe it's a fire watch tower, whatever it is, those purple structures are the buildings that are providing us coverage. Now, these fire watch towers have an interesting quirk. Basically, they look at trees to see if they're burning out in the woods, not necessarily connected to roads, and they'll call on the fire helicopter depot to dispatch helicopters to put out forest fires out there. But, and I didn't know this even just a few weeks ago, if you put these a little bit closer to the road, it'll also recognize the houses. And you can see as we move that a little closer to the road, it goes green and we've got better coverage now. Be aware that when it comes to the service coverage of any of these things, the fire, police, healthcare, education, the road directions affect things. So you'll notice that I've got this kind of gray patch on my highway entrance to the city because for fire coverage to work there, it would have to leave the city, hit the turnaround, come all the way back in. So it's actually a really long way around to get to this thing that's, you know, technically on the same block as the fire station. So one way roads will affect that. And when you see things that are in the gray, it doesn't mean that they won't be covered. But thanks to one ways, it could mean that they won't be covered. So be very careful with one way roads. Be very careful with your service coverage and keep in mind that, you know, anything that's in the gray, you'll see the buildings there are red. They're a fire risk. They're further away for the fire stations to get to. They will get there, but it might take a little longer and the building might burn down by the time they get there. So try and have really good coverage. Use things like the fire watch towers to cover trees and use little tricks like moving it a little closer to the road and you can provide fire coverage to an area that may not have a fire station right nearby, but now the fire helicopters will be on their way sooner. A useful note while we're talking about fire coverage, and this applies to police as well, is that you can paint a district and then give it the helicopter priority policy so that in this instance, I've got a farm area here and there's no fire department anywhere nearby. You're seeing an isolated exit off the highway that handles 100% farm related traffic and there's no fire station anywhere in this loop. I've set the helicopter priority policy. How we do that is we need to paint a district and then you can inspect on the district and apply a policy only to it. So this doesn't have to be something that's applied across the entire city, just maybe in a small part. With the helicopter priority policy, if there are emergencies on areas with this policy, services will always use helicopters instead of ground vehicles. So instead of, you know, rolling a, a fire truck out from, you know, our downtown area way over there up the highway, coming all the way around, the entire thing would be burned down before 
they got the truck over here. Um, so that way the, the helicopters just take a direct route and they'll prioritize this area over others when there's multiple calls. You know, while we're talking about policies, one that is nice is smoke detector distribution. It significantly reduces the risks of fires. It costs a little bit per building. If you're prone to fires like I am because you put way too many trees on your maps, then it may not be a bad idea and a worthwhile investment to reduce some of those fires from happening in the first place. Up next is crime, and this is very similar to fire in that, you know, you need good coverage. We can see areas that are really far away from a police station are in the gray on the roads. And you'll see that it trails off all of a sudden over here. Um, also, the vehicles that you're looking at that info view for. So in this case, we're looking at crime. All the purple vehicles that you see are actually police cars, which seems like there are a lot in this neighborhood. <laughs> but that's okay. They're patrolling the edge of the beat. The worse your police coverage is, the more likely you are to have crime. There's also other contributing factors though, which include education and employment. So if everyone is poorly educated and unemployed because you have your city balance way off, which we'll find in a minute that I do, that can introduce crime into your city. You have a couple different options for police station. There's a smaller version, a larger version, a police helicopter depot, and this will patrol the city with helicopters. You can apply that helicopter priority policy I mentioned a moment ago to an area, and that will also handle police, not just fire. But one other metric worth looking at is jail availability. So if we inspect on any police station, we can see that in this case, there are 11 of 90 criminals in holding cells. How many of the police cars are currently in use? Once those jails fill up and they run out of places to put the criminals, the criminals go free. So you can either add multiple police stations and headquarters, but you can also add prisons. And these will actually store a lot more prisoners. In this case, I've got 149 out of possible 750 spots for criminals in prison. This has uh, prison vans, service vehicles that leave the prison, go to pick up prisoners uh, at the police stations and then bring them into the prison and you notice they just walk right through the gate willingly and just go about their business inside as unrealistic as that may seem it gets the job done and it makes sure that criminals aren't spilling out into the streets once the jails in the police stations are no longer capable of holding anymore looking at healthcare, we've got a lot of the same options when we think about healing citizens so we have the small med clinic the larger hospital as well as a medical helicopter depot, which can be very useful if you have areas that are really disconnected from the roads, like my farming industry area is. Or if you've got really bad traffic, they might be able to get there faster than a vehicle, an ambulance would be able to get there. Now, depending on the DLCs that you have, you might also have some ways to generally boost the health of your citizens. And that includes things like the sauna from the Snowfall DLC, the sports hall and gymnasium, the community pool, and the yoga garden from the Green Cities DLC. All those things have a positive knock-on effect for health within an area, so you can spread those around your city just to make your citizens generally healthier and happier. There are a couple other buildings worth mentioning in terms of healthcare, one being the Child Health Center. This is a small facility. It increases birth rate within the building's radius and offers health services to children, creating a health benefit in the area. So uh, this will actually really help you boost your population faster if you're looking to grow your city and hit that next milestone, add in some of the child health centers and it will really help you on that path. And at the other end of the spectrum, we've got elder care. And this basically will help citizens live longer. And the longer they live, the more taxes they pay. So it's never a bad thing. Um, just extends lifespan within the city and uh, can make everybody happier as well. As happy and as healthy as you make them though, eventually everybody dies. And the cemetery is one of the places where you can lay those bodies to rest. Eventually it will fill up though. And with the default game mechanics, what I have to do is maybe build another cemetery over here or a crematorium. And then I can inspect on this building and empty it. And it'll empty the contents to another facility. This is a similar mechanic to what happens with the default in-game garbage dumps. Now, if you want a tip and a trick for quickly emptying a cemetery so you can move it without 
uh, any mods or other game mechanics. Uh, you can use the Natural Disasters DLC and you can cause a collapse on the building, which will instantly break it down like that. We can then bulldoze it because you can't bulldoze a full building. And then we can go back into healthcare and drop a brand new cemetery right in its spot. Make everybody happy. And you can see that icon basically is saying that this is, is full of stuff. Um, I think that's an appropriate icon for a full dump. Keep an eye out for those icons um, because every city eventually has uh, what's referred to as a death wave when lots and lots of people die. Uh, lots and lots of people move in. They all live the same number of in-game years. And when they all die at the same time, if you had a huge population explosion, you have a death wave. So you got to keep an eye on your cemeteries, make sure you have good coverage and make sure they're not full because if they're full, they're not picking up bodies and you'll notice skull and crossbones all over your city. If you do have good coverage, but you're still noticing those crossbones popping up everywhere, make sure and consider your budget. So a higher healthcare budget increases the number of ambulances and hearses that will go out and cover your city. So in a temporary pinch, you could always increase the budget for that um, if you run into one of those death waves. Building on some of the mechanics that we've already discussed, when it comes to education, you have green roads where things are available. Hopefully you're green on the slider that you see on screen, and that means that you have enough capacity for the eligible students that you have out there. But keep in mind there are multiple tabs here, and those meters are individual for elementary, first high school, university, and if you're using a uh, public library, which I am not in this case. On the education tab, we've got a few different options. You start at elementary school, and if you have green cities, you've got two versions of every school type. So you have the elementary school, or the community school, the green cities version of elementary. High school, and the Green Cities version, Institute of Creative Arts. University, and the Green Cities Modern Technology Institute. Now we're not talking about campus DLC just yet, but it is something that I'll briefly bring up. But just keep in mind that all of these things are affected by availability. Just remember that all these individual types of schools are affected by their availability, their capacity, their placement, and you'll wanna dot these all around your map. Just to give you a quick idea, this is a fairly small city of 35,000 people, but you can see I've got a ton of elementary schools spread out across the map. Same thing with high schools, but in my case, my university coverage rather than the built-ins is done with the campus DLC, but the same principles apply. People need to be able to get to it and there needs to be enough capacity. In fact, I have to back this one way, way down. Um, I grew my city very large so that I could unlock the Eden Project Monument and then I deleted a bunch of people and moved them out. And I still haven't backed down my university capacity, so I'm wasting a lot of budget on that. Education is a really important and I think misunderstood mechanic in cities though. The more you educate your Sims, the better jobs they get, the more taxes they will pay, the happier they are, and ultimately it can contribute to land value as well because all these things can cause buildings to level up. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But education is such an important component, and I think it's definitely better to over-educate your citizens rather than under-educate, but it depends, I guess, on the kind of town that you're going for. If you have a lot of office and commercial jobs, especially in office, because there's more slots for educated workers than there are for less educated workers. If you're going for a more industrial approach in an area, then maybe it makes sense not to over-push education. And in fact, you can, decide where to do what in different parts of your city. If we go into city policies, I've applied the education boost policy, which prioritizes education over working for young adults, and it does increase the education budget, but basically forces everybody into school, and if you're trying to upgrade a university campus, then that's the way to go about that. If you're having problems though, staffing work, and that especially can happen a lot early on in your city's growth, Setting the schools out policy, citizens will prefer working over education. Only a small portion will go on to study in university. So they'll, they'll basically finish high school and go into the workforce. So you can use those to balance if you're having particular problems. If again, you're trying to upgrade a university, go with education boost. If you're trying to upgrade 
your businesses and there's not enough workers, then schools out is the way to go for that. These can also be applied in particular districts. So if we inspect on a particular district, we can go into policies just for that district and change, say, education boost and turn that off and apply schools out instead. It doesn't make any sense to apply them both. You want one or the other, and you could apply one citywide, but then say, hey, for this neighborhood that's over here by my industrial area, maybe I want this to kind of feed the industrial workforce in this area, and they'll maybe be more prone to go working there, because again, there'll be more jobs available for the less educated. Just keep all those things in mind, because again, I think education is a really misunderstood and underestimated concept in cities in terms of how it can positively impact your city when you do things right. Uh, how it can negatively impact things if you're not. Up next is the population tab. And here we can see a couple different metrics on our city. In this case, we've got a population of 34.4. 11,000 people are employed. There are 15,000 jobs available and 21% of the population is unemployed, which is unfortunate. So in this case, because I've been running the education boost policy for so long, we actually have people that are overeducated for some of the jobs that are out there. If we go back and inspect on any building, we can see how many worker slots there are for various spots. So we have one of one uneducated slot. We have zero of two educated slots, zero of five well-educated, and then we have 15 of eight highly educated. So how does that work? Well. One thing that you can do is industry 4.0 policy. This will cause all industrial workspaces to be for well and highly educated citizens. Increased production output by 50% and reduces workplaces by 30%. That will help with your industry, but some other job functions like office and commercial space will over employ highly educated people if they need to but they won't employ, say, an uneducated person into a slot above their education level. So an uneducated person cannot go get one of those well-educated slots or a highly educated slot. They will hire over-experienced or over-educated people, basically, in this case. Again, education is such an important part of balancing things in your city. Looking next at general citizen happiness, well, We've got residential, commercial, office, and industrial. And in the case of industrial, I don't have any generic zoned industry, so it's not really an issue. It's just not gonna show up on the map. But we can see how happy people are, say in office jobs, in commercial or residential. And there's a ton of things that can affect the happiness of an area. Everything that we've talked about so far can affect the happiness of a residential area. So how close do I live to a school, to a cemetery, to healthcare? to transport options. Do I live too close to some of those things and they cause noise pollution or a ton of traffic that's on the road that I live on? They can both impact things in a positive or a negative way. So keep in mind, the more covered a building is with city services, generally the better it is for happiness and also for the building's level, which we'll talk more about in a moment. But the happier your citizens are, the more likely they are to stay in town, to continue paying taxes, and to be part of that ecosystem. You can also make people happy by dropping in the occasional park or tennis court or whatever leisure activity you might think of. Space those out so that people are generally within some form of entertainment, exercise, leisure, something like that um, will make them happy. Now I had warned you up front that this was gonna be a long video and we're not even halfway through at this point. So I'm gonna split this one up into multiple episodes. You know, we're not even getting to the point where we're really deep diving into any one of these topics. You know, I could probably spend a half hour episode just talking about electricity or water or any of these things if we really wanted to dive into all the details. So I'll split it up here. We'll cover the rest in the next episode, or I, I think we will, two episodes at most. But I wanted to make it somewhat bite-sized and consumable. There'll be timestamps on all the different videos in this series, and, and eventually we'll dive in deeper into every one of these topics. But you know, troubleshooting your city is really important. Kind of understanding what's there in the info views can be really useful, especially for those of you that are just starting out or maybe just running into a problem for the first time that you haven't had. So 
Let me know what you think in the comments down below. We'll be doing more of these again. Keep an eye out for uh, a couple updates in, in this series alone. Uh, I'll try and get them all out this week, but I can't promise. If you enjoyed the video, and you probably did if you stayed tuned this long, likes, comments, shares, they all really help. And if you're new here, subscribe for more and considering the bell to get updates for this and other series. If you have questions, let me know in the comments down below, but the better place is the Discord because there's a whole community of people, fans of the channel and fans of cities, and generally can provide assistance a little quicker than I can in the comments. It's really tough to keep up with some time. I appreciate all the support and feedback, but it is tough to keep up with. So come on by the Discord. If you'd like to support the channel, links to that and all those other things are in the description down below. Again, stay tuned. There'll be more in this series. And if you want to see how this town that we've been viewing uh, got built up in the background, check out my Let's Play Season 10, where I go through step by step of the creation of this city. There's still lots and lots to talk about. And like I said, I'll try and get it down into uh, one more episode, but at most two episodes this week. Stay tuned for that. I hope you have a good one. And until the next one, this is Move the Mouse signing off.